we have a tremendous problem on our hands. We are 4% of the world's population here in the United States, yet we consume 56% of the world's pharmaceuticals. I hardly ever meet a woman who says, wow, I'm so well balanced hormonally. <laughs> it's been a while. That belief system, folks, is still there. And now why, how could that be? I will turn to this bio-identical hormone only when I'm desperate, when all other things have been tried. <laughs> Thank you. You are becoming more emotional as you age. That's why your wife likes you better. <laughs> Unfortunately, that affects every single one of your hormones within your body. There's this incredible crisis on us. Male fertility down by 70%. Our adrenals are on all the time. It makes you less male. It makes you uh, a little bit estrogen dominant. And all of a sudden, we don't have the reserve to deal with it anymore. And I, and I was talking to the other gentleman today and he goes, yeah, I'm not gonna let him beat, him, beat me. I don't care how old I am. I'm gonna run until it hurts and I'm gonna beat him because that's just where I am. I said, that's good. We've got good testosterone going here. I like to see this. It gives energy. It increases libido. It makes muscle. It changed how he looked at stress. A few minutes later, I see this poor woman just crying her eyes out. We think it's one of the main causes of depression besides gut health. <laughs> and they'll leave patients on it for years at a time. DHA is a pro-hormone. It, it can drive estrogen, it can drive testosterone. If you overdrive estrogen or you overdrive testosterone, you can create cancer in the long run. You can create inflammation in the long run. Who are the caregivers in this world? So. Let's give our brains a little break, just a little break here. With a woman, same stress. Amygdala is on. It increases circulation to the frontal cortex three to six fold. I, I want you to know, honestly, I was just sitting there. Helping them modulate themselves in a proper way can make an incredible difference in your life. We held on to our hormone replacement therapy for 53 years in spite of overwhelming evidence that it was costing the lives of so many women. I have stage three breast cancer. That's the stuff we're seeing. Very young girls with breast cancer. Because we don't tend to our hormones, the fire goes out, libido goes down. Now this is a little disheartening, isn't it? But it can come back. And really that's all we do here at DBC is give the body a chance. That's why you find our doctors a lot less cocky because we're not over here hijacking your body, making it do things. No, we're just removing barriers, allowing it to work like God intended it to work. It's a big difference. And intelligence that has been created within, it's amazing what it can do. Hey gang. Hello. I'm Dr. Denbor for those that, uh, for those of you that's, that are here for the first time, I see a lot of new faces, so welcome. I, um, I'm a board certified and licensed naturopathic doctor as well as chiropractic physician. And I'll be giving you an uh, awesome presentation, of course, on hormones. And um, Dr. Stacy, uh, our in-house hormone expert, is going to weigh in as well. And uh, Dr. Stacy is a chiropractic uh, physician as well and is also board certified in uh, chiropractic veteran, how would you call that? Chiropractic? Animal chiropractic? Yeah, animal chiropractic. So see some unique cases. So if you ever see some horse, horses galloping through here, that's what's happening. <laughs> so so I, I, those of you that know me a little bit, uh, I like to go uh, with just some random research first, something that just strikes me. And as we were sitting there just munching down a little bit of salad, uh, uh, Dr. Stacy said, well, are you, are you going to cover any research? I said, oh yeah, shoot. So, this is literally from just a few minutes ago. So, here it is. New York Times, health section. It's a pretty good section, by the way. They do a nice, uh, nice plethora of, of emerging research. And it's, uh, it's nice and easy to read and it's just, uh, it's always entertaining. The article goes, long-term risk of antidepressants. The question, 
are there any substantial studies that focus on the side effects uh, of long-term, 10 plus years, of SSRIs? Okay, so those are the uh, serotonin reuptake inhibitors. And um, their, uh, their answer is, the answer is no. I want you to know the answer is yes. But your question gets to the heart of an important problem that we have in this country, that all medications are approved by the Food and Drug Administration on the basis of a relative short-term studies, even though many are used long-term for medical and psychiatric disorders that are chronic, if not lifelong. The FDA approves antidepressants uh, like uh, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, or SSRIs, if the drug beats a placebo, which is not saying much, in two randomized clinical trials that typically last four to 12 weeks and involves a few hundred patients. Long-term maintenance studies, usually lasting one to two years, indicate that SSRIs do not cause any serious harm, though they have plenty of side effects like weight gain and sexual dysfunction. And then it goes on and on and on. Uh, basically, um, they say themselves, we, need, we clearly need a better system for position uh, for uh, post-marketing surveillance of all drugs that would create a vast database for which we could answer these questions. I'm going, you think. Um, medications right now uh, kill over 100,000 people a year, according to the FDA themselves. And these are properly prescribed medications. We're not talking overdose, wrongly prescribed medications. If you include all those, the uh, numbers uh, go high so fast. And you know, we get so many numbers thrown at us. It, these numbers seem to not matter that much, but just think about it. 100,000 a year plus, that's more than what the Vietnam War killed in the, its entirety uh, times two. Uh, and so we, we have a problem. Um, four we, we, we are four percent of the world's population here in the United States. Yet we consume 56 percent of the world's pharmaceuticals. Okay, so, so it's, it's, you know, obviously we have a problem here. And when you look around you, you see that there's, there's issues. And I want you to know my home country, the University of Groningen, which is a, 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 a renowned university that's, that's up on, on top of the country, did uh, uh, research, SSRI research, about two and a half, three years ago, and published it in, um, I believe it was Lancet, so a, a very well-known medical journal, and it stated this, that SSRIs, on average, within nine months, cause more depression than it cures. And th this was kind of a shocking revelation, as you can imagine, because these drugs have been used for so long, that the Dutch government ordered a redo of that, of the whole, the whole study. And so uh, they got University of Leiden behind it, uh, which is considered the Harvard of, uh, of Europe. And uh, they came to the same conclusion, except the conclusion was that the same and worse. And they were able to figure out the mechanism of why antidepressants do this. Why do they cause depression in so many people? And the reason for it is, is the gut houses 90% of your neurotransmitters. The brain only has 10%. So that means the majority of your serotonin, your, your feel-good hormone, is mostly in your gut. And you think that that SSRI is going to work only on your brain? Think again. It's systemic and it will work in your gut as well, and it will block the neurotransmitters in your gut, and eventually will cause gut issues. And those gut issues then have a profound effect on the brain again, causing anxiety and depression. At that point, the negatives outweigh the positives. I have so many patients that have been in Prozac for decades. And believe me, it is a job for Dr. Stacy and I to get them off. It really is, because the gut, everything is so altered at that point. So I just wanted to put in my mild dispute with this article. Um, it seems like sometimes we only listen to what, uh, what we uh, learn ourselves and our own studies. But why not listen to the rest of the world? It's, it's not like they have a lower IQ. Uh, uh, th these are very well done studies. They're accepted. They are published in our journals. And I think it's time that we start listening to them. So, hormones explained. Cortisol. Well, what we've done with this seminar, hormones, of, as you can imagine, it's just a, fun, it's just a huge topic. And I've, I've been, uh, uh, Dr. Stacey and I have been researching this all month because where do you go with this? Uh, it's this big monster. Uh, and we decided to, for today, focus on what we feel is the number one hormone that affects all other hormones in our practice. And then next time, we're going to go through and explain the other hormones 
and its effects even further. Okay, so fasten your seat belts. This, this one should be fun. Uh, the, the idea for this, this seminar was birthed by this very simple fact. A few months ago I realized that I hardly ever meet a woman who says, wow, I'm so well balanced hormonally. <laughs> it's been a while. And, and in my thick little male brain, maybe in their teens, I recognized <laughs> that we have a tremendous problem on our hands. And growing up with just sisters, me being the youngest one, I very early on in life <laughs> recognized that hormones matter. <laughs> A lot. <laughs> and so right, really from the get-go, I've always been very interested in hormones. Because I also found in graduate school, the male professors poo-pooed hormones like, there was, like it wasn't even hardly there. And it, frankly, it made me angry, especially when it was stated, not once, twice, but numerous times, that PMS really wasn't a real thing. Now this is a few years ago, I recognize, but it's still, that belief system, folks, is still there. And now why, how could that be? It's because most research is rather chauvinistic. It is driven by mostly male scientists. It is changing, luckily, finally. But I would say 80%, and that's my guess, but I bet you 80% of research is done on mostly males. And isn't that pathetic? <coughs> because who are the caregivers in this world? Right? And um, so, uh, when we ask, is your cycle regular? Do you have PMS? Is your skin wrinkling? Is your hair falling out? How's your energy levels? How's your moods? Is there any breast tenderness with your period? Do you have acne? Do you have growth of hair in unwanted places? If I get a patient that just says, no, 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 I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. I had a moment like that this morning, I want you to know that. Because I was asking a few hormonal questions because it sounded like we were going there a little bit. But no, no, she denied any issues. I go, wow, that's the first time in a long time that I've met a woman who truly is hormonally balanced. Why do you think that is? And males, listen closely. Because this seminar will benefit you hugely. Not just for your own sake, but for the significant other in your life. Because if you can understand what's going on in your wife, girlfriend, fiance, significant other, the world would be a much better place. And we have hormone problems of our own. We really do. And we're going to cover that a little bit more later. But male fertility has gone down by 70% in just one generation. It's a little bit like the statistic like autism, for instance. Uh, I'm just grabbing something out of the air. But when I start a practice, which is only about 24 and some years ago, autism was 1 in 22,000. Now it's 1 in 63. And that happened in a very short time, didn't it? In the big scheme of things. You'd, you'd think that people would go, oh, whoa, 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 there's, there's this incredible crisis on us. Male fertility down by 70%? Really? But yeah, the, the numbers do not lie compared to the 1960s. So we are in a crisis hormonally. Where is all that coming from? It's multifactorial, as you can imagine. Let's discuss. We're going to go through the web of health because I feel everyone should really understand what functional medicine is really all about. Going to go through hormone overview, that way we don't lose you, hopefully. Then we're going to focus on how cortisol affects hormones. Cortisol, by the way, is our stress hormone. We'll go into that in more detail later. And then we're going to finish with the web of healing. So here it is. Let's see if the light will help a little bit. You guys like that? Is that okay? Yes. Okay. 
So here's the web of health. Here's you at the center. And we are so affected by everything, aren't we? So our gut, for instance, gastrointestinal health. It's responsible for 50% of estrogen metabolism. It's 70% of your immune system. It's how we make a lot of our vitamins. It is responsible for all of our nutritional needs for building hormones. If something's off there, it will affect you in a huge way. For example, it will also affect your detoxification. I, I can go all the way around, I'm not going to, but just as an example. Because if the gut is not working well, it'll foul up your liver function because it has to detoxify and clean up after it because you reabsorb all those toxins into your gut. And now your liver goes funny on you. Oh great, that's all we need because your liver is already under stress from just the environment. We're talking the pollutants in the air, the plastics that we consume, literally through our foods, uh, the preservatives, the less than ideal lifestyle that we may have food-wise in America, genetically modified foods, pesticide-laden products. I can go on and on and on as you can imagine. Um, I, uh, so the liver then goes south, in other words function declines, and what does the liver have to do with hormones? Well, have you ever noticed that perimenopause into menopause is when a woman often starts getting gallbladder issues. Gallbladder is connected to your liver. Why would that be? It's because estrogen, the bad estrogen that we have used up, gets excreted through bile. Gallbladder, out, it goes into the toilet eventually. Yeah? The liver does that. If the liver is already overburdened, it's not so successful at it and the bile it secretes with, loaded with all this bad estrogen clogs up your bile, your bile duct and your gallbladder. That's why 50% of gallbladder removal surgeries are done in just those few years of perimenopause and menopause. Does that make sense? So yeah, 50% of your estrogen gets detoxified by your liver. If it doesn't do it, you go into byproducts that are really toxic. Got, one of them is called 3,4-quinone, and 3,4-quinone is very cancerous. It gets stuffed into your fat cells. Now you become obese because your body's protecting all that estrogen, doesn't want to release it. These are the women who just cannot get, lose the weight. Yeah? So that's a detoxification. Reproductive, I think, is so, sort of self-explanatory. Um, and I, I, I can go on and on and on. Uh, let's just, let, let's say, pick urinary. Um, uh, urination is how we excrete spent cortisol. Um, so when you've had a stressful moment, uh, you have to get rid of that spent cortisol. It's through urine. When we do too much of that, it will cause chronic cystitis. And chronic cystitis is just so, so epidemic. We see so much of that. It's where the bladder is chronically inflamed and it just doesn't function well. Prostatitis, same thing, because with hormones, you also have the male version of that, where you get too much dihydroxytestosterone, which is a byproduct of testosterone that's not being detoxified adequately, and now the male has too much dihydroxytestosterone, which causes inflammation of the bladder and the prostate. Okay, it makes you less male, it makes you uh, a little bit estrogen dominance, so I don't know if you've noticed that males, but you are becoming more emotional as you age. That's why your wife likes you better. <laughs> <laughs> but you also may notice other unwanted characteristics, like muscles are a little bit more floppy, even though you're still exercising. You're carrying a little too much weight right here. And you're losing hair in places where you don't want to lose it. Right? Seems like you lose it on top here and out it comes over here. <laughs> Funny thing happens when you age. So, so this really affects us. And let's not spend too much time because I've, I've, as you can tell I can have fun with this all night long. Everything is so interconnected. And that's why, yes, a specialist is so critical because sometimes there's some vexing weird problem that needs diagnosis. But in the end result, shouldn't your doctor be a specialist in all those fields because they all talk together. It's all connected. And that's why I so badly wish that all the specialists would be in the same room together and just talk to each other so that they get out of their own little world and say, 
Oh, really? You mean constipation could really cause depression and depression really stresses out the adrenals? And adrenals are the precursors to your hormones and that's why she may be having PMS? You know, there's all these things that are connected. So, important stuff. So hormones matter because it affects cell metabolism, life of cells. It affects homeostasis. Uh, another word that's becoming in vogue is allostasis. And what do these big words mean? Is basically the body's always trying to form, uh, find some sort of balance. And we think, well, balance is perfect when it's right over here. No. Because a minute later, your situation might change and we need another kind of balance. Right? It's just like your elusive journey for balance in life. I don't know. If you found it, please call me. Um, um, but uh, it's the same way with hormones. We have measured estrogen, progesterone, testosterone changes within the minute, from minute to minute to minute. They constantly bounce up and down. And that is their balance. They're constantly responding to the stresses of everyday life. And that's called homeostasis or allostasis. Allostasis is another word for responding to. Reproduction, it's absolutely critical. The very dance of estrogen and progesterone at certain times of the month and when you're pregnant, the change in, uh, in, in, uh, in ratios uh, is profound and allows us to uh, uh, engage in, um, in harboring a baby in a very safe haven. So reproduction. Development. Um, this one is, is so cool because I, I get to teach my, uh, uh, my, my kids that come in, come in here uh, right around 13 to 14 and I can explain to them very calmly what's going on in their body and they're all kind of embarrassed and it's, it's, it's fun but it's fascinating and they need to know this stuff and that what they're experiencing is normal. Um, behavior. Um, I don't need to go there right now, do I? It's, uh, uh, yeah. Anyone who has hormones knows that it affects behavior. And organ reserve. Or, what, now, what is organ reserve? Organ reserve is fascinating because let's say you go to graduate school a few years too long. And let's say you work full time at night doing that while having a, ca a family. And let's say you finally, finally graduate and then realize that you have absolutely no energy left to do anything. And you develop hepatitis, you develop mono, you can't, the former athlete that you were, you can't even go run. You can't even have a sip of wine because you feel it already. Your organ reserve is gone. Adrenals are done. The liver has shut down. The immune system is done. There is no reserves to lean on. And it is quite a journey, folks, to bring that back. Once, you, once you've lost organ reserve, it can take years to bring it back. An excellent book on the topic, it was done by Esther Sternberg, The Stress Within. And she talks about adrenal burnout. A brilliant researcher, endocrinologist, teaches at McGill and at the Ivy League schools. Love her work. I follow her work very closely. And she was under the gun herself also. Complete burnout and just happened to be able to take a sabbatical of one year because she had enough share, uh, seniority uh, within her uh, teaching career and went to this little cabin on the island of Greece and spent a year recovering and it did take nine months. She did all the blood work to show it took exactly nine months with a perfect regimen of a Mediterranean diet. It's exercise, lots of contemplation and it's an entertaining book to read if you want to go for it because she'll, she'll describe the island where she's at and the little villages and the, the weird persons there and then the next one goes into the science and then your brain gets another break and goes into all the little weird stuff. Um, love that book and it's very well documented. So, but that just shows you that once you've gone through your organ reserve, it takes work and not everybody has the luxury of going to Greece. So your main hormones, uh, we're going to spend time with cortisol right away. But estrogen, we're all too familiar with that one. And estrogen makes you all woman. It is a really important one. It even does things you don't even think about. Like keeping your joints juicy. Seriously. 
your skin elastic, your metabolism going. It affects your moods. It can, believe it or not, be a very happy hormone. It can also be very evil when, you become, uh, when it becomes dominant, when it goes into its inflammatory byproducts. It can be very pro-cancerous and really work against you. Progesterone is kind of the counterbalance of estrogen. It balances out any excess there might be and it mellows you out. Progesterone is very nice and is very often deficient. It's one of the more common deficiencies. Both these hormones are also there in males, obviously at a fraction, but they are very, very critical for the male health as well because they do counterbalance testosterone because believe me, if testosterone goes out of control, it is not braked by other hormones, we have issues. We definitely have issues. Testosterone is important for both male and female. For male, it gives them the drive and the energy. It is not only about libido, folks. It is about ability to make muscle. It's about mental clarity. It's about being able to really focus on something. And it is a really good emergency hormone. For women, it does the same thing. It's present in just a fraction of that quantity. Obviously, we don't want too much, but it does the same thing. It gives energy. It increases libido. It makes muscle. And it, uh, it's part of being a woman and a very often ignored hormone. The one thing that's in vogue lately is to do testosterone creams when it's low. It's about one of the worst things that you can do out there because that testosterone, I feel, can become very pro-cancerous. I will turn to this bioidentical hormone only when I'm desperate, when all other things have been tried. That's when you may turn to that. And I have a few patients that do do it, but we watch and monitor them very carefully because it can become very toxic quickly. Thyroid is kind of the choir director. Uh, it's also kind of a little weakling, actually. Um, the thyroid is extremely sensitive. It's like the canary in the mine. If you, what they did in the 18th century, as you might know, is they took canaries downstairs in the mine because canaries are so sensitive. A little bit of gas uh, leak and boop, they go over. That's why you can't use Windex around canaries. I don't know if anyone's ever had the misfortune of cleaning a window and watching little Charlie. Okay, <laughs> not good. Explain that one to the kids. So, so, so uh, uh, thyroid is extremely sensitive. So, so if your body as a whole is inflamed, then of course the thyroid's going to suffer. If you have to, and some sort of hormone dominance and that's caused inflammation, thyroid will suffer. It's also the choir director. Okay, so it, it tells the other hormones where to go, what to do, and uh, it, really, uh, it really sings part of the symphony. It produces energy within cells. Um, very often um, it is subclinically low in women. 50% of women at age 50 do suffer from subclinically low thyroid. In other words, the range of normal is still within range, but remember folks, the range of normal that they use here for thyroid is ridiculous. It's big enough to drive a Hummer through and it's nowhere near the optimum where it should be. And um, so uh, when we analyze thyroid levels, if we do utilize blood work, uh, then um, uh, the range of, of normal that we uh, recommend here at DBC is much narrower. Now remember um, uh, about testing, and, and, and Dr. Stacey, are you gonna go through testing? Okay, if, if I may make one comment on testing, I may not, but I'm going to anyway, um, is, is that oftentimes blood gets, you, gets regarded as the holy anointed oil of, of testing, but honestly, it's, it isn't. Because what if your thyroid levels are absolutely normal, but the thyroid isn't being absorbed into the cells? It's okay in the blood, but it's not okay within the cells. And that's really what counts, doesn't it? Because a hormone is really like a lock and key. So uh, where uh, uh, the cell has the lock and up comes the hormone, supposed to attach, turn, and then entry in, and it does within the cell what it's supposed to do. It makes the cell behave a certain way. So what if we have just adequate amounts of hormone, but the lock is kind of rusty? It's not going into the cell. You tell the patient, no, your, thyroid's not, total, your thyroid hormone levels are totally normal. Next. Okay, let's check something else. It isn't that. But it could be. 
So therefore, these lab analysis, number one, the range of normal is so huge, and number two, it, you could be resistant to these uh, uh, hormones, and therefore it might still not be accurate. And that's why your doctor should be listening really, really, really carefully to your signs and symptoms. Because that might tell us more than the blood, urine, or sal saliva work in. Is that making sense? Okay. And insulin. And we're not going to talk much about insulin. Uh, we're going to talk about it a little bit. It, believe me, folks, this is a huge issue. Also, about 40% of America is resistant to insulin. This is why you see the predominance of belly fat. This is why you see the incredible increase in cardiovascular events because a high insulin equals high infl inflammation. Insulin is a hormone. It will displace other hormones. It will make other hormones more inflammatory and is a big, big part of our problem. So just keep in mind, insulin is woven through all this. We've done a lot of sem seminars on insulin, so I don't want to cover that one. And it's like be a, beating a dead horse. Um, uh, but just keep in mind, it is a huge problem. And if you feel like that's part of your problem, we need to address that. So cortisol, what is cortisol? It's the hormone that governs <coughs> hunger cravings, digestion, blood pressure. So if somebody cuts you off on the way out in the East Beltline, you want to hope for just a little immediate blood pressure spike. So your brain gets the fuel it needs to, so it can make an instantaneous adjustment to the situation. What if you're chronically high in cortisol? Chronically high in blood pressure. Is that a bit of a problem in the United States? Mm-hmm. Your sleep and wake patterns. Very often, with a patient, I'll take blood pressure, sitting, let's say it's 120 over 80, then I stand them up, check it again. 110 over 70. Hmm, that dropped by 10 points. Next question, it's almost automatic out of my mouth. Do you wake up around 2 or 3 in the morning? Because I just measured a drop in blood pressure upon standing, indicating the patient could not rally cortisol enough to at least maintain blood pressure. So we got cortisol issues. And cortisol is a glucocorticoid. <laughs> And gluco by the way, I just throw out these big names so I look smart. So a <laughs> glucocorticoid, just remember the word gluco is in there, and corticoid is a, a steroid. So it's a hormone that affects sugar levels. So guess what happens when you have abnormal cortisol at night? Your blood sugar crashes, usually right around 2 or 3 o'clock, and your brain wakes up and goes, whoa, wait a minute, what's this? This is not good, it's time to get up for breakfast. Not. It was your hormones doing that. Yeah, so that's why this and this is so connected. Also, the sugar that gets provided to the brain really affects thoughts during the night. So that's why we often ask, do you dream at night? And if so, do you remember them? If a patient does not remember them, their dreams, they often will have cortisol issues. See how everything is all kind of connected? All of a sudden, we're a psychiatrist. All right. It also affects physical activity. That's why when I graduated, I couldn't even go outside on a day like this because it was too warm, my body couldn't cool itself, and I'd be out of breath just walking. That has a huge effect on power. If you have had a lot of stress, let's say you went through a whole lot of a real stressful situation, just really acutely stressful for about an hour, Try climbing the stairs, see, see what it feels like. You'll literally feel weakness in your knees. Yeah, you know that saying, knock need, right, ye, ye, like that? That's from cortisol, it weakens muscles. And of course, your capacity to cope with stress. Because if, if there's one thing that I, I have learned and gotten respect for, is what stress for one person is really isn't for another, isn't it? There's, 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 I remember so well the, the one day, this is not that long ago, uh, one of my patients is an executive from a very large company through here, and um, he seemed kind of stressed one morning. This is very early morning. I says, oh, hey, what's going on? He says, well, my mother's dying. My uh, two associates just decided to file a lawsuit. My son in uh, way out down south, his, his business is going bankrupt. I got to go fly there. Then I have to have a meeting with my lawyers, and I have to tend to my mother. So yeah, I'm, I'm just a bit stressed. I'm going, okay. He's stressed. 
But he, he was handling it. He, he was dealing with it. I come into the next room a few minutes later. I see this poor woman just crying her eyes out. Just out of control. And I finally got out of her between sobs that what she was crying about was her sinus infection. And I looked and checked and indeed it was there. It wasn't even that bad really. I checked the lymph nodes. It, it, was, it was not a big thing from a medical perspective but to her it was absolutely huge. Therefore it got the empathy that it deserved for me because she was experiencing real stress and I made a mental note that sometime when she was ready to receive this information, I was going to enroll her in yoga classes. Yeah, just to, to relearn how to reset and process stress more effectively. It's absolutely huge. So that was really a stark reminder for me that it's not the stress, but really how we receive stress, how we mechanically, how we process stress. And there's also something called mirroring 101. And when we mirror something, it's really, if we're in a stressed state and it's making us a little funky in our thinking, then it seems like everybody else is acting funky too. Does that make sense? And pretty soon you think you're surrounded by a sea of idiots and that's, you know that's just, just not true. That's just not so. It's us receiving that information and processing it in a way that we shouldn't. And believe me, life becomes really, really stressful. So capacity to cope with stress. So notice I did not say stress, but capacity. So how does this stress response work? We have something beautiful called the HPA axis. Hypothalamus, pituitary, adrenal. Hypothalamus sits right in our brain in what um, I think ironically is known as the primitive part of the brain. And last time I checked, I don't find anything primitive about the brain, but that's what they call it. Um, and um, and it's, 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 it's a brain that, that deals, that's part of the brain that deals with the most basic functions like breathing and digestion and heartbeat, right? Just the really, really essential parts of the brain. The hypothalamus sends a signal to the pituitary gland, which then communicates to the, the adrenal gland. And the adrenal gland, by the way, sits right on top of your kidneys. They are little pyramid shaped things that are well, about a centimeter high. Um, but they shrink and they uh, uh, can overgrow depending on the stresses that that person is exposed to. And there's this wonderful feedback loop where the brain tells the pituitary, hey, we need some uh, cortical uh, releasing hormone uh, and adrenal cortical tropical hormone and all that will just stimulate the adrenals to produce cortisol, cortisol to the rescue. Cortisol is a good hormone. It's very, very beneficial. It can be anti-inflammatory. It raises your blood sugar when you need it. It raises your blood pressure when you need it and it can be very healing. So the brain tells the adrenals and it's a feedback loop. However, This feedback loop does not respond well to the American way of living. 40% of meals are done in a car or standing up. You think that's kind to cortisol. We are bombarded day and night. Text messages, emails, breaking news. Just the invention of the phone ratcheted that up a lot. But where are we at today? It is absolutely nonstop. When, really when we're relaxing, we're not relaxing. How many of us truly eat in silence or with the companionship of our loved ones that we're sharing a meal without interruption of some beep jingle or oops, I gotta get that one right away because I'm waiting for that message. It happens but it's not the majority. And that's just one small example. Our adrenals are on all the time. Then you add to that major stresses, which occurs in every life. And all of a sudden, we don't have the reserve to deal with it anymore. We do not have the reserve. We've worn through the reserve. Here comes a major stress. Death of a loved one, divorce, moving, loss of a job, Marriage, getting married, some of these can be happy stresses, but they're still stresses. Reacting to a food that you're allergic to, major stress. 
So toxic relationships, toxins from the environment. To the adrenals, it doesn't matter. They're all stresses. Makes absolutely no difference. If you happen to be gluten sensitive, you have gluten, major, major stress to the adrenals. What happens? It causes telomere shortening. And as you could tell, because we are very evidence-based here in, at DBC, everything we do has to have rhyme and reason and has been proven in clinical research. Okay? So if you look at the slides, you'll be able to see this on YouTube, hopefully uh, in about seven or eight days. You can study the slides a little bit more. You can see, for example, number two right there, telomere shortening. It's by, these are the authors, and then the title of the article is Accelerated Telomere Shortening in Response to Life Stress. And that was published by Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences USA um, in 2004. And it shows you which pages that that's found on. So uh, all these statements we back up. There's, th th there's no fluff here. So telomere shortening, what is that? That is aging of the cell. We know this is the one and only proven way that we can measure aging besides death of the cell. And telomere shortening, there's good news. We now know it can be reversed by meditation. And this was done uh, by um, yoga as well as uh, mindful awareness. And mindful awareness is just a fancy word for deep breathing, totally relaxing all your muscles, and being aware of the stress and putting a label on it and then letting it go to be dealt with later. So we don't keep on obsessing about it. It's actually quite successful. It sounds kind of hokey, I know, but it is not because it allows you to recognize the stress, put a label on it, next, instead of keeping on running it through your brain and increasing cortisol, upsetting your digestive system and upsetting your hormones. Really, really important. So it can be reversed. We did not know that just a few years ago. They said, if your telomeres are shortened, you can't reverse that, you've just aged yourself. Now, good news, yes, we can bring youth back. It's, there's no question about it. So it increases all signs of aging and decreases brain blood supply. Now this is kind of an important one, isn't it? So if a patient's had tremendous stress for extended periods of time, you will affect your brain. And you can literally see brain shrinkage on MRI and CAT scans. Now this is a little disheartening, isn't it? But it can come back. Did you know that the stress of going through perimenopause and into menopause will shrink your brain by an average of 10%? You're going, oh, that explains it. <laughs> 10 percent. I think that's shocking. I'm afraid if you do this, you'll hear it. <laughs> but folks, if we go into menopause successfully, it can come back. So because it has all these neurological effects, and this is from an article, Impact of Chronic Hypercortolacemia and Effective Processing out of the journal called Neuropharmacology. Depression. We think it's one of the main causes of depression besides gut health. In the Netherlands and most Western European countries, depression is considered a gut disorder first. But we know that cortisol goes right up there with it and they probably occur simultaneously. Depression caused by cortisol. Maybe we should be doing that instead of our Prozacs and who knows what else. Maybe we should be addressing this one. Alzheimer's. There's always all this tremendous, tremendous amount of research into Alzheimer's because yes, it is an epic problem. We think in the very near future, 30 million Americans will suffer from it. We, it will bankrupt this nation. And the research that's going on is on the mechanism, what's happening once Alzheimer's has started, and it's valuable. I, I want to emphasize that. We got to understand that process too. But did you know that by the time the first signs of Alzheimer's hits, the process has already been occurring for 30 years? That is big stuff. And do you know that that time of 30 years, that's where intervention can take place and you can reverse it? We have seen that here at DBC. Alzheimer's is treatable unless the damage is irreversible. And there's some very easy ways to assess that. For example, this very simple test that I'm doing right here. See what I'm doing with my leg? Should be able to do that for 20 or 30 seconds. It is considered one of the most accurate ways of measuring if a patient is bordering on Alzheimer's. Sense of smell is the other one. We have the tools to do this, folks. And yes, cortisol measurements. 
How are we doing with stress? Huge in its impact on Alzheimer's. We know that the fuel to the fire is often a food reaction, gluten specifically, we know that, as well as sugar dysregulation. But what is sugar dysregulation? Caused by cortisol. So really, there's a new name for Alzheimer's in Europe, diabetes of the brain. See, so you hear oftentimes, we don't know the cause of Alzheimer's. Yes, we do. We do know that. Just read all the different journals and put the information together. It doesn't happen just out of the blue. It's very rare that there's actually neurotoxicity due to only a chemical exposure. It does happen. I've seen that. But most of the time, it's lifestyle. Most of the time. NMS. We know that that is so, so connected to the adrenal stress response. We have seen flare-ups in our MS patients just with this, and not infrequently, but most of the time. It's a food that affected the gut, or it is a spike in cortisol that gave us the MS flare. MS, therefore, is very treatable. And I know that this is not going to go down well with some specialists. It will not, because supposedly it's an irreversible disease. I know of a brilliant researcher, and I mean it's brilliant, out of U of M, all he does is study MS, MS, MS. But they're only studying what's happening on a cellular level. And again, I have to emphasize, it's really good to know that. We need to know that. But how about the effects of everything else that's causing that in the first place? That's not looked at. So high cortisol, so let's say we put you in a high stress, okay, we'll put you, uh, you've never been in a race car before, we'll put you on a racetrack, go, keep up with the others, high cortisol, and let's do that for a long time, yeah, silly I know, but just high, high stress, weight gain and belly fat, right here, that's where it goes, why, because there's sugar dysregulation, higher insulin levels, that's the sign of sugar dysregulation. So can't lose the weight. Yeah, really important one, folks. These are some of the people that are desperate. They are exercising. They are doing so much with their food. They're awesome. And I feel so bad for them because maybe the stress of the exercising is actually causing their weight gain. I have seen it that patients are overstressing their adrenals with too much exercise for their body type and situation, and it's making them gain weight instead of losing it. I've seen this frequently. Therefore, we are firm believers is exercise right for your situation, for your gender, as well as for your age, and your personal situation. Does that make sense? Like today, Dr. Stacy and I have put in, I don't know, 14 hours, Right, seeing a lot of patients, doing a lot of cognitive work. Not the most relaxing work ever. Absolutely love it. But it would be really wrong for Dr. Stacy to go home and for I to go home and decide, you know, I'm gonna do about an hour of sprints tonight. It would be absolutely foolish because we would be stressing an already stressed adrenals and it would exhaust it further. What would be way more appropriate on a day like this is go for a nice fast walk, walk, hike, whatever, in the woods or on a driveway, you know, wh wh whatever's convenient. Yeah, you can get your heart rate up a few times, absolutely. Maybe a few little sprints, but that's it. Whereas if you have an easier day and there's less stress and you feel like your adrenals have recovered, that's when you can hit it and get mean with yourself. And that, then you would get the benefit. So, blood sugar is all over the map. Insulin, resistance, diabetes, sugar dysregulation. I had a patient last week, type 1 diabetes. Type 1 is insulin dependent. Not curable, supposedly. Came to me about a year ago. And half-heartedly did some of the changes that I spoke about because he got dragged in by his wife. I love the guy, and he, and he was nice, he, you know, he wasn't antagonistic, and we did everything we could, and I, I recognized the situation, we just worked with it, and he made some improvements, lost a little weight, and he was looking a little better, but not really. 
comes to me, I think it was two weeks ago. Doc, I'm not taking my insulin. I go, what? <laughs> not good when somebody just dumps their medications. Gets my attention. I says, really? I, first thing I said, well, what's your blood sugar like? He said, perfect. I go, wow. He said, um, how'd you do that? He says, well, I finally started doing what you wanted me to. Okay. <laughs> Didn't realize it was that bad. So much for my persuasion power. Put everything into play that we had had with the support of his mom and his wife. And he was able to get himself totally off of his insulin injections. I'm not saying everybody can do that. That would be a really silly statement. But don't ever underestimate the healing power of what the body can do. And you know what the most important thing that he did? He changed how he looked at stress. He didn't change his stress. He changed his perception thereof. He changed his processing. And that then became a lot less stressful to his adrenals, which, remember, is a major glucocorticoid. And somehow, don't ask me how, it allowed his pancreas to start working again, something that's not supposed to be possible. Amazing what the body can do when given a chance. And really, that's all we do here at DBC, is give the body a chance. That's why you find our doctors a lot less cocky, because we're not over here hijacking your body, making it do things. No, we're just removing barriers, allowing it to work like God intended it to work. It's a big difference. And intelligence that has been created within, it's amazing what it can do when given a chance. So PCOS. Diagnosed very few times. This is polycystic ovarian syndrome. Cysts on the ovaries, one of the top causes of infertility, often associated with high testosterone levels. But high cortisol levels pushes testosterone up. PCOS, you often see the hair growth in unwanted areas, very wicked periods, lots of PMS, infertility. We think that over 20% of women now have this. Diagnosed, only 3% of women. Very underdiagnosed. If you don't look for it, you don't find it. Insomnia, that's the rest of sleep, and bone loss. Now, isn't that interesting? It really affects inflammation and osteoporosis. Now, this is my opinion, so we're going outside of what, what has been proven. My opinion is osteoporosis at some point will be considered an autoimmune disease that is caused just by overall inflammation within the body induced by the most part by gut issues and high cortisol. This is out of a big uh, journal article out of Journal of Bone and Mineral Research uh, in 2011. So, low cortisol. The first we covered was high. Eventually, just like the pancreas and diabetes, you can produce too much insulin, you can, just like adrenals, can produce too much adrenaline or cortisol, eventually it will burn out. That's what I experienced after graduate school. Done. Nothing left. Zippo. Low cortisol is the end result of prolonged stress. You get adrenal insufficient, uh, insufficiency, hypopituitaryism. Uh, we have um, a patient that has been coming in. Um, uh, he comes in from Detroit and he has these magnificent headaches right there. Just right there and nowhere else and he can never ever get rid of it and he's not sleeping well. Did the basics with adrenals and did some cervical manipulation because there was some connection there. Didn't really go away that like we wanted to. It wasn't until we, until we discovered the, uh, and did some lab work, the hypopituitaryism uh, uh, that we were able to start addressing it and put them on a B complex. Uh, adrenal support, thyroid support because their whole mechanism was messed up. His headaches that he'd had for such a long time, totally gone. Low thyroid. Trauma can cause this as well. Low cortisol production you often see in boxers and dirt bike racers. Why would that be? Ever hear of the kidney punch? Huge with boxers. You know, that's the one way to get the guy down. Guess where the adrenals are? So trauma, same thing with dirt biking accidents, right? 
tra trauma right here is a, is a very common dirt biking accident. Prolonged stress, prolonged thyroid being low, steroids. Dealing with a fellow right now uh, who has um, ulcerative colitis has been on prednisone too long for a year and a half at too high a dose. Totally shut down his adrenals. We're struggling to get it back as we speak just to bring it back online because without adrenals you don't function. You cannot rally healing. You cannot rally your anti-inflammatory effects. Your body will not respond to the positive inputs unless you've got some things going there. And if the gut is constantly irritating your adrenals, you've got issues. You doing okay in here? It's a little warm. Yeah? All right, I, I can start going up and down and keep you awake. <laughs> yeah? All right. So chronic fatigue syndrome, that's supposed to say CFS. Chronic fatigue syndrome is one of the main things with low cortisol levels. See that a lot. Very curable, folks, chronic fatigue syndrome. About, um, I would say our success rate with that is about 70% within a half a year. Fibromyalgia is actually easier. That's where the muscles get all inflamed and very painful. Using a product called Ultra Clear Renew as well as adrenal support, about a 70% improvement proven by clinical trials in fibromyalgia symptoms within six weeks. Six weeks. Electrolyte issues, potassium, magnesium, swelling in the hands. You ever experienced that with, the, with your period where your hands get puffy and you get that notion, I feel fat. Um, I, uh, uh, you get some edema in the ankles. Okay, cortisol and bone loss. The big thing that um, I'm going to discuss is really how cortisol affects all of your hormones. The one thing that Dr. Denbor uh, neglected to tell you is that the backbone of every single one of your hormones is cholesterol. So I know everybody went on the low fat craze and you know we always have, we're trying to lower our, lower our cholesterol, lower our cholesterol, be on all these meds, get this down so far. Unfortunately that affects every single one of your hormones within your body. So the lower you drive your cortisol, the less that's bioavailable with the medication, so then you're, you're affecting your insulin re resistance. You're gonna affect your estrogen metabolism. You're gonna affect how your testosterone or your prostate works, depending on what's going on in your body. So really, fats are good for us. It's certain types of fats. So I know I don't wanna steal your thunder, so I won't talk too much about the foods for you. <laughs> um, but really, uh, let's talk a little bit about cortisol and progesterone. Some of these are gonna roll together. You're gonna see how uh, they work together. Progesterone, as, as most know, um, tend to be more, you hear about it more as a female issue. We have estrogen, progesterone, and testosterone. Everybody has all three of those in their body, so it's men as well. Progesterone is actually the second step after cortisol, or after cholesterol. So cholesterol is your backbone, and then it goes into progesterone. And then basically from there you map out into whether or not it's going to turn into cortisol, whether or not it's going to go over into testosterone, or DHEA, or even into estrogen. So there's a lot of pathways here that could get scrambled up or mixed up depending on what's happening within the system. Smoking affects all of these things. Alcohol consumption, stress, how we deal with stress, exercise, over-exercising. All that's going to change how your body reacts with cortisol. So cortisol and progesterone, progesterone being the, the top guy on the notch when, when the backbone starts, really what happens here is when your, your cortisol gets high, it's creating a progesterone steal or a cortisol steal is what they call it. So basically it's stealing all of your progesterone out of the system to get that cortisol high because it has to drive straight down into the cortisone path cortisol pathway. So the issue here is what most people, I put up symptoms for you more than anything, is that uh, women would notice heavy periods. You'll get some PMS, irritability, which men also get when they have high cortisol levels, they'll get irritability, insomnia, goes across the board for men and women. So when we have high cortisol, we tend to not sleep all the way through the night or we struggle to fall asleep. Okay, so these things really make a difference. The other thing that, that comes in here that most people don't realize, we all know that progesterone is really good for preparing the uterus for a fertilized egg, keeping us balanced within that pregnancy. That's what helps to sustain a pregnancy. If progesterone is not there in sufficient amounts, that's when miscarriages tend to happen. So this could be part of the infertility complex. On top of this, most people don't realize that progesterone also regulates heart function. 
So the arrhythmias that some people notice, women will notice those, especially during perimenopause and menopause, they'll get arrhythmias. And partially that's because the progesterone is being leaked out of the system. So we're losing our progesterone. It's not always as simple as saying, okay, it's just a progesterone cortisol issue, as you'll see as we run through. So when cortisol and estrogen work together, um, a lot of times, estrogen, most people don't realize, it's very relaxing hormone. It, it's meant to create antidepressant, gives us that anti-lytic effect. It really just keeps us balanced overall. Unfortunately, when estrogen becomes too dominant, it works completely the opposite, so it shuts off that. When estrogen is high, what women will notice too when they run in estrogen dominant symptoms, <coughs> we tend to react more to foods. We have more blood clots. That's when it's creating inflammation within the arteries, it creates inflammation within in the intestinal tract, and inflammation within the entire system. So too much estrogen is a bad thing as well. Cortisol, when it drives up, it wants to drive with estrogen. So it steals a progesterone, but then you're still getting that estrogen bump from usually your fat percentage. So most of the time when we have estrogen dominance, we have fat storage throughout the waist and the hips. That's one of the most common things that we see. Now, moody could fall under all of these categories. I do want to point that out. Weight gain can fall under a lot of these as well. Now, estrogen, the biggest one that always gets the, the research behind it is cancer. Everybody knows that estrogen dominant cancers, there's problems with that. That has a lot to do with how the effect of cortisol happens with estrogen. So when we have patients come in that are dealing with cancers, the first thing we want to know is, well, what type of cancer was it? And then the other thing that we want to know is how can we turn around that pathway so that you're actually breaking that cholesterol or the backbone down of estrogen so that it can cleave and bind to things within your gut to be excreted out of the system. So that's why Dr. Denbor was talking about the gallbladder is so important for women. A lot of women, and we're seeing them younger and younger and younger. Uh, I was working with a 16 year old today and we already had spasticity over a gallbladder. She was showing me every single sign of gallbladder um, inflammation and, and technically possibly already getting stones, which is then leading to, her, to huge hormonal changes every month. So we're working on dealing with her gallbladder, but she's 16. Usually we don't see that until you're 40 or 50 when you're hitting menopause, but that's just showing what the change is happening within the entire life cycle. Androgens, which these are what most people think of as testosterone. DHEA also falls under here. Um, DHEA is, has, should be in concert with cortisol. They should balance each other out. When one is high, the other one is low. When one is low, the other one is high. Now, the unfortunate thing here when cortisol raises, it also will steal the, the backbone to make testosterone. So I get a lot of men who come in and are complaining of libido issues. Um, and a lot of times it's mainly because their cortisol is running way too high. The stress is too high within their body or they have too many, could be food sensitivities, we could be an abnormal estrogen balance where the testosterone is actually creating DHT, which is more estrogen-like. That's why Dr. Denver was also <laughs> alluding to the fact that men do get a little bit more soft as they get older and that's because they become more emotional and that's, they're changing into menopause. Instead of menopause, it's menopause for them. So they're starting to change into more estrogenic like we do. <laughs> so a little bit more tender. Um, so that does give you other issues on top of that. This is where most women will see acne. That's what Dr. Jimbo was talking about, acne and like male pattern areas or you'll get that hair growth right where mustache or chin lines. Um, a lot of cysts come in here and this is where he was talking about polycystic ovary syndrome. Uh, the other thing that we also look at a lot with polycystic ovary is its insulin resistance within the uterus. So the uterus could be abnormally working with its insulin regulation and you have to deal with why is the uterus having insulin resistance. And then you work with different supplements and things that help to drive that, that insulin sensitivity back to where it needs to be. Um, with this, uh, also, this is where I find with a lot of uh, gentlemen, they'll have acne when they're younger. Um, and that's really where the acne comes from, is just because they're having an imbalance of their androgens. Mainly they're getting more of DHT instead of testosterone, so it's creating more acne for them. So then also re creates that sensitivity within the gut, so they're sensitive to foods, on top of all of the other things. Now testosterone, um, I kind of covered that w with the androgens, but um, this really, as, as Dr. Denbor was talking about, this does affect your drive. 
So, and most people, they think about the drive as being a competitive drive. And, and most men, as, as we find out, they've got a lot of competitiveness in them. I was just talking to one gentleman tonight, and he's, he's about 20 years older than one of his counterparts that uh, they, they do races with, they run 5Ks and 10Ks. And um, the, the other gentleman that is about 20 years younger always says, I gotta beat him, I gotta beat him. And I, and I was talking to the other gentleman today, and he goes, yeah, I'm not gonna let him beat, him beat me. I don't care how old I am. I'm gonna run until it hurts, and I'm gonna beat him, because that's just where I am. I said, that's good, we've got good testosterone going here. I like to see this. Um, so this also, when we notice that we start to get those flabby arms or we're starting to get weak, I get a lot of patients who come in and say, you know, when I'm exercising, I just don't feel like I'm gaining muscle or I just feel weaker. I have to drop the weights down a lot. And that's really where you're getting that testosterone is decreasing within the body. Everybody, really when it comes down to testosterone, this, this does talk about libido a lot here, um, especially when we're talking about hormones and dealing with that within the rooms. Um, we have to deal with this fact. The unfortunate thing is most people, just as Dr. Jumbar said, are, are turning more to the testosterone creams, which are definitely a lot more reactive than other things that you can do, especially with dealing with cortisol. If you lower cortisol, you'll automatically stimulate the pathway to go to testosterone. So you'll have that balance just in general. So it takes a lot to get these things balanced. <coughs> Mental clarity is huge as well. Um, you'll notice uh, the more that we, we become less competitive, we have less of that drive, we start to lose our muscle tone, our brain function goes as well. We tend to get a little bit more foggy and, and we get frustrated easier because we just can't think through what we want to do. Um, the one thing I really like, uh, I was doing some research on the testosterone and trying to find ways to, to describe cortisol and testosterone. Does anybody remember Mad Libs and the spy versus spy? Basically, that's exactly what it is. Testosterone and cortisol are the spy versus spy. And they stay in concert together and they do just fine at equal levels until one guy launches an attack. So say stress happens and cortisol jumps up. Well, testosterone is basically getting plowed over by all the bombs that the other spy is throwing and, and he's down, down here in the dumps until things level out. If things don't level out, testosterone will stay low and cortisol stays high. And then it just creates that inflammatory system that just keeps going and going and going. Now, as, as all this works too, you have to think about the thyroid. <laughs> thyroid, as Dr. Denver says, it's, it's kind of the, the weak guy of the group. Um, it's affected by everything. It's, it's more of the, the little sensitive person over here that, that just uh, anything that pops up, the thyroid could go off. Cortical re releasing hormone, which, which releases cort cortisol. When that hits on, it inhibits TSH from going on. So that's going to stop the pituitary from telling your thyroid that we need more thyroid hormone to the tissues in the body to get the metabolism working, to keep us warm, to keep our muscles building. So when cortisol is high, you're inhibiting every factor of your entire thyroid. So it's really, really important to keep these things balanced because if not, you're, you're running a, a negative cookie cycle and you're, you're juggling with too many things and not enough hands to keep them in the air. So you're that guy with the spinning plates and you're running back and forth and this plate falls and that plate falls and you can just keep the one going and that's all you're doing, okay? So testing wise, I sorry I didn't get my slide in here, um, but testing, the, the blood work, I know a lot of doctors really look at blood work. And when you're coming to look at testosterone, estrogen and progesterone, that's where a lot of doctors just want to test, is they just want to look at blood work. Well, for most women, unless they're in menopause, um, really you're getting a snapshot for one piece of the day. That doesn't do it for you. If you're cycling, you need to have salivary testing throughout the month to give you a good idea of what's the rise and fall in the different sections of your cycle. So estrogen should rise within the first 14 to 16 days. If there's no fertilization of the egg where the progesterone is high, then they both start to fall down because progesterone will come up and they'll both be high and then they both go down. So if you're not testing that way, how do you know exactly where you're supposed to be? Because you know the ranges when they, when they put um, for blood tests, they'll look at estrogen and they'll say luteal phase, follicular phase, perimenopausal, menopausal. That doesn't do us much good because you could fall in a follicular phase, but you really don't know where you're at in your cycle. And unfortunately, then that may give you a false positive reading. So we do a lot of salivary testing. We use Genova Diagnostics um, primarily for our hormone testing. The rhythm test is one of the most common that Dr. Denbor and I will use. It's 11 salivary sample over 28 days to give you a good idea of what your estrogen, progesterone, and testosterone levels look like. 
The other most important one that we tend to use is the adrenal cortex stress profile, also by Genova. That basically looks at your cortisol and DHEA levels. That's a really good one because it does test four different salivary levels throughout the day. And for what most patients with what I'll do is I'll also tell them, okay, there's a time, especially if I have a cycling female, usually around ovulation or wherever their PMS symptoms start, that's the day I want my testing. Because I want to know where, where's your cortisol level and your DHEA levels falling on those days. Because those really are the most important times that you want to look at. For men, it depends. Because some men notice, okay, the weekends I'm completely stress-free, everything's great. By the middle of the week, I'm really ramped up. I just can't get things calmed down. So that's the day that I want to test more than any other day. Um, and then I can find out what's the worst day of your the time frame for you. Um, and this really gives us a good idea of whether or not you're running the fact of the cortisol steel and there's no progesterone to balance things out because I know that's one thing they don't talk about a lot with men is progesterone um, or are we just struggling with the DHEA? DHEA is, is really one of your, your good balancers in the long, long run. It's what they call the anti-aging hormone. The problem is, is, is too many doctors use it as just a free-for-all. They'll just go out and say, Let, let's put you on some DHEA and they'll leave patients on it for years at a time. DHEA is a pro-hormone. It, it can drive estrogen, it can drive testosterone. If you overdrive estrogen or you overdrive testosterone, you can create cancer in the long run. You can create inflammation in the long run. So what I always recommend is I wanna see a level before I'm gonna throw you on that and I'm not gonna leave you on it very long. I wanna see three to six months, take you off, find out if your body has balanced on its own because a lot of times in that time frame, we've got the lifestyle changes in there, we've got the food balance to try to get things moving in the right direction and there's no need to support that hormone anymore. Does that make sense? All right. I think I've, uh, <laughs> I think I covered enough. Tour de force by Dr. Stacy. <laughs> so, let's give our brains a little break, just a little break here. Um, I just wanted to show you this, uh, I saw it sitting there, so I thought, you know, the, these are the pathways and of all these hormones, the one that's connected to the other, and you can't really see this up close, but you'll see arrows going back and forth. Everything is biofeedback loops. And what doctors are often doing is they're, they're working with the end results right down here. Estrogen low, give a little estrogen. Testosterone too high, let's do something to bring that down. And so we're just being very reactive. That's what we call downstream practitioners. And the ones that really aren't thinking are just putting you on the birth control pill. Because let's just hijack all your hormones. Let's just cover it all. You don't even have to worry about this mess. It doesn't even matter where it's going to go. It's just patient's happy, I'm happy. How about working upstream and really going with the causes? And have we convinced you yet that cortisol production due to stress response is maybe a small factor with hormones? It is on top of the pyramid, and that's where we go. And if you leave and say, wow, that was a mess that, that, that they presented today, well, you can go to YouTube next week and watch it a little more carefully, watch pieces of it and try to figure it out, or just remember, I gotta do something about the stress. A lot of pieces will fall into place on their own. And part of the stress is really recognizing how we operate as a male and female. Because if we understand a little bit how a male responds under stress versus how a female responds under stress, then you might, just might find it in yourself to find a situation a little bit humorous sometimes. And that will help with stress. You see, I don't know if you've noticed, but we handle stress differently from each other. There's this little wonderful on-off switch in the base of the brain called amygdala. It responds to stress. Funny thing happens when a woman is stressed, it turns on. When a man is stressed, it turns off. Interesting things happen. With a male, the front of the brain goes dark. Literally. Blood flow decreases. Males under a fair bit of stress, 
you know what he's going to do. He's going to mess in the garage, <laughs> pretend to be busy waxing the car because it's oh so important, <laughs> really withdraw into his cave, right? Mm -hmm. If you go in there and interrupt him about this or that, might look in your general direction and grunt a bit and go back to work. The woman is under stress. Or, no, I'll, t I'll, I'll take this one, one further. Or the male would just sit in his favorite chair in the corner of the living room. He's kind of looking blank. And the wife will go up to him. John, what you doing? What are you thinking? Nothing. <laughs> but, 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 we got this to do, this to do, this to do, and, and all, all those things. And you just get a bit of an irritated look. The vigilance is gone. It's not there. There are ways to wake, up, wake that up, and I can go over that if you're interested. But with a woman, same stress. Amygdala is on. It increases circulation to the frontal cortex three to six fold. Hypervigilant state. Men, have you ever noticed as you're sitting there calmly relaxing? That all of a sudden, the sounds of dishes and the, the doors in the kitchen slamming harder and harder and harder. I have. <laughs> in fact, a few weeks ago, I was sitting there being what I thought was productive. I was doing research, but it didn't look like it, apparently. So I'm sitting there. Not noticing that the dishes got louder and louder and things bang, 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 got faster and faster. And the shuffling of the feet got faster and faster. State of hypervigilance. Didn't clue into this. Must have been some fascinating research I was digging into. <laughs> Finally, from the kitchen comes this. You remember 20 years ago? Blah, 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 blah. I go, where did that come from? Just this, this, this distant thing that I did 20 years ago just got flung my way. And I'm going, whoa, duck. Oh, then I remembered, ah, blood flow increased three to six fold to the frontal cortex. Enhances memory like there's no tomorrow. <laughs> there it is. I, I want you to know, honestly, I was just sitting there. And this thing from 20 years ago comes flying at me. And I marveled at the intensity of that memory. I want you to know I got up and helped out. And, okay. Males versus females, totally different. How does a woman relax? How do we get that hypervigilance to go down? We've got studies. We've got some really cool studies that are gender specific. <gasps> we actually know what works with a male versus a female. They actually took the money and studied woman, finally. And here is what it is. We know that a woman can reduce her cortisol levels by 50% in a quiet room with instrumental music, not voice music. It has to be instrumental for five minutes or in a pleasant environment and do nothing but simply some deep breathing exercises. Go longer than five minutes, however, they start making lists. <laughs> five minutes. Males are indifferent to that. It doesn't particularly raise Cortisol doesn't really lower it, it really does nothing. Except the deep breathing part. And they can do that anywhere and it will reduce cortisol. Not as much as with females, but it does. What else is very gender specific? Tend and befriend. It's huge. What on earth is that? And we have some large studies showing this. Did you ever notice with the kids on a playground, Fascinating to watch. 
I love being able to once in a while pick up, especially when my kids were growing up, I've got five of them, and just kind of watch it from a distance, the playground. Just watch, and first of all, how's my kid doing in there, right? You guys, and how's, how's, how's everything just working? It is fascinating, these playgrounds. Because here we are, we have these little fourth grader boys, you know, just being absolute jerks. You know, climbing the trees, being destructive, throwing things, teasing the girls, and you know, just oh, blah, blah, you know, th you know that thing. And here's the girls; they're all in little circles, doing their little thing, right? They're tending and befriending, even at an early age already. They are taking care of their oxytocin levels. That's what they're doing. And this is very, very important for women because raising oxytocin lowers uh, co cortisol tremendously, and oxytocin gets released with personal communication with, yes, guys, and especially with women. That's why you often see women saying, walking together, they're exercising together, right? And they're talking. They're tending and befriending their oxytocin levels. And their oxytocin release really is an incredible stress response. I get some of these type A women in there, and they're in high executive positions, and I ask them that, when's the last time you really went out with your girlfriends? Are you doing that regularly? I often get no, they don't have time for that. They don't have time not to do it, because adrenal burnout will cost them a lot of time, believe me. It makes them a lot less effective. So tend and befriend is really good. This is why it's so important for the males to just shut up and listen. Because we're so solution oriented, and all we do is fire back, well, you should do this and this and this, but no. You have to listen and maybe once in a while throw in some advice because you can't help yourself. <laughs> Guys are wired differently. How do they lower their cortisol levels? By raising their testosterone. That's the guy's oxytocin levels. And how do we raise our testosterone? Weightlifting, more extreme exercise, and doing stupid things. Right? Midlife crisis, I'm going to buy a dirt bike. I'm going to see if I can still pop wheelies, blah, blah, you know, just, just stuff like that. Testosterone levels go up. Wonderful for the guys. That's relaxing for a guy. That's what they have to do. They have to tend to their testosterone levels that way. Very important. You just have to watch that it doesn't become too self-destructive which may be part of the reason that married men, on average, live five years longer. Yeah, because they have that tempering force, because guys tend to be somewhat self-destructive, as any woman will tell you. <laughs> so, understanding the different mechanisms of communication is pretty important. The guy is very solution-oriented, and maybe as a woman, we need to let the guy do that. Because as a guy gets to solutions, that also raises their testosterone levels. So we have to give a little leeway on both sides and tend to our hormones. Because if we don't tend to our hormones, the fire goes out, libido goes down. Not because the husband or wife are snotty, no, it's because literally the hormones are going down. And we have to tend to our hormones, don't we? Because that's part of the relationship. With a woman, that makes a woman. And with a guy, it makes the guy. And it's like a lock and key. It kind of fits together a lot of the time. So how we react under stress is kind of fascinating. And is real biological and is very hormone driven. And what we have found, and this is also a very important one for especially the guys, if we have shared responsibilities at home, whatever stresses are at home creates an almost equal amount of cortisol rise with stress in both male and female. If the home front tends to be a little bit imbalanced, and let's say mom is doing all the running around and doing the vacuuming and doing the dusting, and the guy is doing his sitting in the corner thing, 
cortisol levels in the woman just goes crazy. And there's a huge imbalance in hormones because of that. And that's why the fire goes out. So we have to really tend to our hormones. And it starts with cortisol. It is the one that affects our hormones the most. And no matter if you're talking about estrogen dominance, progesterone deficiency, adrenal insufficiency, and testosterone, you know, I, I can go, I'm, and we're gonna go into that stuff. It's fascinating. And there's a lot of stuff you can do to rescue it now while we work on the stress levels and work on the other things. There's a lot of things we can do downstream. But you've got to start at the top and be truly holistic in your thinking because that's what's behind most hormonal issues. It's what we see the most often. So how do we heal things? Well, understanding how we operate is one. Exercise that is very specific for us depending where we're at in the burnout phase. Food, nutraceuticals, doctor support. Make sure your doctor actually listens. Hormones requires a lot of listening. And you can make your doctor understand it more effectively by making sure you've got it written down because that way you don't forget some of these important details. Because one of the most important things, Dr. Stacy and I hear, and oh, by the way, Believe me, that gets our attention because usually that little by the way, that little afterthought is the most important clue in the whole conversation. And did you know that 70% of hormonal diagnosis is done by speech only, not even by the exam or testing? Symptoms, 70%, very important communication. That's why we do a lot of these questionnaires. The community, right? How many fridge rights do you have? How many people, people's homes can you walk into and just help yourself to their fridge? That will tell you how big your community is. So community is really important. Your liver detoxification pathways, and we'll talk more about that next time. That's how we break down testosterone. That's how we break down estrogen. Why would a 21-year-old woman come to me just a few months ago and say, I have stage three breast cancer? That's the stuff we're seeing. Very young girls with breast cancer. And why would that be? Overload of the detoxification pathways really affecting what happens to their estrogen. Converting it over into an inflammatory subtype which the body can withstand for a while but not for long. Lifestyle coaching. It's what we love to do. You know that. I'm talking about that ad nauseum. We have these wonderful health coaches that talk you through it. I was just hit under head by my last patient again today and says, well, I finally, because we were having some digestive issues and she always was telling me how sugar affects her. So I said, well, make sure anything that has a lot of sugar, just don't, don't do it. And she was on and it still wasn't helping. Little did she know that I was thinking that she knew that starches are sugar also. That was not very smart of me. She finally discovered that on her own and is now avoiding some of the starches as well, which I, I assumed she knew. And now we're seeing a nice turnaround. Kudos to her for doing the research. Bad number on my side. I really should have referred it to the health coach where we would have gone through all these different things. Does that make sense? So that's the health coaches are outside the box looking in and helps us tweeze apart things that we don't even know we don't know. So lifestyle coaching. How about chiropractic health? You know why my wife married me? Yeah. <laughs> Great adjustments. <laughs> my very, no, she doesn't like it when I say this. But, but, but it's, it's, in a way it's humorous because my very first true adjustment I ever did was on my wife for menstrual cramps. And I'd seen it done. I had no idea what I was doing. <laughs> I put her on a side on the table. She had some really nasty cramps, you know, the kind that, that, that those kind of heat and pack. And I gave it a Harley Davidson kickstart. I think everything from here to here moved all at once. <laughs> she goes, and I did the same thing. And I go, um, how do you feel? <laughs> 
He said, you wouldn't believe this, but my cramps right now are gone. And it was almost immediate. It came back a few hours later. Obviously, it was a lousy adjustment. But it showed her and myself the power of the neurological connection and hormones. That if you can break that cycle, you're hitting all these different pathways. And I now know that the area that I hit has a profound impact immediately on cortisol levels, as well as the nerve that affects the uterus, which does this and was able to break that loop. Gotten a little better at that adjustment since then, I want to assure you. <laughs> so, acoustic compression. For example, if somebody comes in with PCOS, right, or endometriosis, which we'll talk about more, or any kind of thing like that, what we do is we do the sound wave technology, which is the same sound wave technology that breaks up kidney stone, called lithotripsy. This is a profound technology we use here at DBC to bring in stem cells and anti-inflammatory effects as well as break up scar tissue. It is huge what we can do with that. And yes, that's damage control, but sometimes you have to do that, don't you? You have to get rid of these endometriosis, the scar tissue, because they in themselves can become a problem. So, what else can we do for high um, cortisol? And I wrote these down real quick because I wanted to share some of these. Dark chocolate. Yes. <laughs> However, <laughs> their research was funded by Nestle. Oh. <laughs> so, I don't know. See, always look at the source of your research. Decrease alcohol, decrease caffeine. Lots of journal articles in that one. Okay, really big by the way. Acupuncture. been written up in quite a few journals. Back in 1975 in the International Journal of um, Clinical Chemistry, that was back in 75, they published a big one on vitamin C. Three to four thousand units a day was used of fat soluble vitamin C known as ultrapotent C here. And they found a profound impact on cortisol levels with just vitamin C. It does incredible damage control. And they were really only repeating the research that was done by Linus Pauling in the 1950s, for which he got a Nobel Prize. Well documented, how many doctors are using plain old vitamin C for hormones? This stuff works, and it works well. How about phosphatidylserine? It's an oil. It really affects brain PMS because it dampens the cortisol levels. So if somebody is just demonstrating a lot of, lot of uh, depression or bipolar symptoms because of high cortisol, phosphatidylserine. How about if your adrenals are just burned out, low cortisol? What do we do with those patients? Been on prednisone too long, too much stress too long, too many food allergies too long, too much, blah, too long, toxic relationships. Put them on licorice. And licorice will resume your cortisol production and can revive it. Very cool stuff. Other uses for it as well. Love licorice. Black or red? And red licorice. No. No, no. We're talking the extract. And grapefruit juice. This, was, this one was published not that long ago in European Journal of Foods. And endocrinology. Notice that it has different, that it embodies different things. This European Journal, it's a very famous journal. Uh, found that grapefruit juice and grapefruits themselves reduces cortisol levels by 20% when ingested once a day. Grapefruits. Wonderful stuff. And ginsengs. I found so much research with low cortisol level and ginseng. Really, it's the Russians. This is in foreign medical journal articles, so hard to find this, by the way. So, but I found some translations in some Russian journal articles on ginseng, how they used it with their athletes in the Olympics with great success. And from that stemmed research that showed burnout adrenals and ginseng works really well. That's why over here, for example, we have a product called Adderset. Its main ingredient is ginseng, right? It brings back the adrenals. And by the way, a lot of the herbs we use uh, are not only, uh, all our herbs are not only clinically backed, but they also uh, are often adaptogens, which means if it's low, it brings it up here. If it's too high, it brings it down to normal levels. That's called an adaptogen. And we love using those because we're using the body's innate wisdom to normalize itself. So everything is connected and you have to use everything you can. Yoga is huge for high cortisol levels. 
Walking is huge. For guys, more intense exercise is huge. Does that mean a gal can't run? No. It does not mean that at all. It's wonderful for a gal to run. Just don't count on it as your cortisol reducer. That's all. Whereas a guy can. Does that make sense? We're wired differently from each other. So how do you find out more about all this stuff? Well, you can read about it in our blog. You hit the button under resources, you're gonna find lots of info there. If you hit the YouTube button, that's right up on top, you'll find our seminars, right? Like our last gluten uh, seminar, uh, it'll be right up on top. You can hit that and watch that. Um, it's uh, getting more than uh, 150 downloads a day. Just be, be, so this, this, this is a really nice resource that, you're, that you have to um, get yourself educated. Um, we have Facebook, Twitter, all those things. So we have all kinds of lifestyle courses that really uh, uh, work with this. So if you feel like I really got to get serious, um, uh, this, uh, this is one of our favorite ones. Oh, where'd it go? Yeah. And we have a whole brochure on that. Boot camp, you want to lose weight, get rid of inflammation. You want us to hijack what you eat. That's it. Radical results. And most patients don't think it's too hard to do. First line therapy is a little bit more, as uh, Tina likes to say, wading into the shallow end of the pool and get deeper and deeper. Um, so that's, that's uh, a little more gentle because not everybody is ready to just jump in. We do a, a detox, uh, and a detox we're mighty proud of. Uh, it's a very guided detox. Every week changes a little bit, and over the 28-day cycle, we will detoxify you. And uh, in the dig-in section, uh, we talk about uh, personal hygiene and all, all those things, um, how to do it all. A lot of courses. You're welcome to the brochure. This is what we're doing now to, make, um, to try to affect the world. That's about how you're feeling right now. I know you are. And I do apologize for that. It's just, it's such a monster of a subject. But your hormones and energy. Um, uh, we will be attending an international symposium on energy production in Dallas, Texas. Um, so we will have a lot of very fresh information for you that's presented by a multitude of uh, researchers. We're gonna cover your thyroid, what to do about it and just overall energy production because this is one of the main product problems affecting America today. Fatigue, fatigue. It is one of the top things that comes into our office and yes, your hormones are very much part of it. So do you struggle with low testosterone? Hormonal imbalances or chronic fatigue? We'll be hitting it. We're rapidly selling out uh, on this one. Don, do we still have some room in this one? Yeah, we had to open up another class for this one, so we're selling out on that one. Folks, to eat healthy and well is not difficult. It is not difficult. And one of our main frustrations is that people don't know how. Here we teach how. And that sums up hormones. Hormones are a little bit like the bacteria that populate our gut. It controls us. Helping them modulate themselves in a proper way can make an incredible difference in your life. It makes you all woman or all male and life is fun in that lane. Questions? Yes.